to the hilt. Spicy novellas. This is a very kinky holiday. It is a very kinky book. You have Mia, who is a submissive. Her husband and dominant passed away many years ago, and she has decided to kind of step into the dating pool. Her best friend sets up a blind date photo shoot. And I do know that this is a thing that photographers do. They get two complete strangers, then they do essentially a couple's photo shoot with them and see how that connects. And this is all through the BDSM club that she and her husband were members of. They have some sort of founding membership. She hasn't been since he died, but she's still technically a member. Through that photo shoot, she meets Nolan, who is a dominant whose previous submissive also passed away. They are both in that kind of same place post relationship. It's been many years. They are established in the kink community. So it also isn't someone introducing someone to anything new. They are both aware of themselves and expectations and things of that nature. The chemistry they have at the photo shoot is absolutely off the charts insane. Nolan has to get to know her. Mia is a single mom as well. She has a son and is very clear that he is her number one priority. What this book did a nice job of is showing that even when you're in a DNS relationship, which they do enter into, that doesn't supersede all your other relationships. Nolan understands that her son comes first always. She is always going to be mom. He will not stop her from that. It is not his place, nor does he want to. He steps in almost as a pleasure dom, but also a caretaker, someone to take the load off of her shoulders to help her lean on. There's a beautiful moment later in the story, even though it's a novella, it's still later in the story, where she really overextends herself and she doesn't even think to call him. It's new enough in their relationship that it's, it's not unheard of, but... He states, I'm here for you. That's part of my job as your partner and as your dom is I get to take care of you. So put down the baking stuff. She caters. She's a baker. And eat food. I am going to take care of everything that it's within my power to take care of in this moment so that I can take care of you. And that was really special. So we saw some of that DNS dynamic play out outside, but we also saw Nolan being not necessarily just, I'm a dumb all the time, I'm in charge. He was very respectful and clearly listened to what was important to her and made sure to prioritize all of that. Can I just say how spicy this was? Not that there were a ton of scenes, again, novella, not that many, but what went on in those scenes was so much. Nolan organizes a weekend away for him and Mia and they break her dry spell. They break her dry spell real hard in ways that I had never heard. I'm not saying that I am an expert on all things kink, but I have read enough kinky books out there. It, it takes a lot to surprise me. And the hook the hook attached to her ponytail brain situation that that was new i i was surprised and delighted but i was not expecting that i thought that they did a great job with this dynamic i found less objection to the portrayal of kink in this type of relationship than i have in things that i've been reading since smut lovers so yay I don't know how holiday -y it is. It says very kinky holiday. I think it just takes place around the holiday time. If you're looking for a real Christmas story, it's not that. If you're looking for just a story that could theoretically be taking place at any time of year, there you go. So many pink things that I love. Why is it over? Why is this series over? It is the final book in... If Shakespeare Were an Auntie by Nisha Sharma, Marriage and Masti, the final friend in this trio. I'm so mad it's over. Also, I have it, it's beautiful. But you get to look at the picture because then it's not backwards. This is Vera and Deepak's story, it's loosely based on Twelfth Night. If you haven't read Taste Like Shaker, don't worry, I'm not going to ruin that one for you. But in that book, Vera, who is friends with Deepak, she met in Dating Dr. Dill because Deepak is one of Prem from that book's best friends. I know, three best friends all fall in love with the other three best friends. In Taste Like Shekhar, Vera, who has been in love with Deepak, discovers that he is going to be engaged to another woman, basically 
an arranged marriage for the benefit of their business and she is devastated. There's also some family drama that happens before that. Her father merges companies with Deepak's father and then fires her and her twin sister. So they go on this worldwide trip both to get out of Dodge and also build a client base for a potential future financial firm that they are going to open together. It's been eight months since they left at the start of this story and Deepak's engagement crumbles. Olivia, who he was engaged to, is a social media influencer and she has a get ready with me video where she breaks up with Deepak on social media. It's absolutely a dick move. Olivia is not my favorite at all. She annoys me just as much in this story as she does in the real Twelfth Night. Vera and her sister Sana are shipwrecked off of Goa and they lose their wallets and all of their monies and they need someone to bail them out. And so Vera calls Deepak who instead of just wiring the money decides to fly to Goa to escape the fallout from his very public breakup. While there they get fake married and this is where it's a little bit confusing but I kind of love it. They meet an older couple who got legally married in Germany years ago and they're doing a Hindu ceremony in Goa for their anniversary but the wife of this couple is very unsure of the traditions. She doesn't speak the language and so Vera and Deepak offer to go through the ritual before them so that they know what to expect. So they get fake married. It's not legal, but according to tradition and God, they are now married. <laughs> so they go back to the States as husband and wife and pretend to be married. They do tell their friends that it's kind of a fake marriage, but they're in this fake marriage so that Deepak can win the vote for his company and so that Vera can start up her firm. Y'all, there's a lot of family drama and business intrigue that goes along with this. They move in together, so it's also forced proximity. Vera is just trying to survive this time with him. She's in love with him and she has been for quite some time now. Deepak discovers he's in love with her that always feels a little icky to me where oh no you've been my best friend for months and if not years and suddenly it isn't suddenly he kind of put her in a I can't date you box early on when they met because of their relationship with their friends I would have assumed you still thought about her in a sexy way but apparently not if you saw my video for Taste Like Shaker, I absolutely love the way that Bondage was brought into that story. Bunty in that story loves Bondage. He introduces it to Bobby. He talks about it. He sets it up. This story, I read it right after Smut Lovers, so I'm very sensitive to it, felt like play light, BDSM light. I didn't love it. He called her a brat earlier and like, oh my gosh, are we about to have a real conversation? And they don't. They kind of just faux play with it. They talk about, oh, punishment or this or that, but they don't negotiate. They don't talk about limits or preferences or anything. And so it felt a little icky to me where Tastes Like Shake are still involved communication about preferences and what was going to happen and what were they going to be involved in. Just because you call her a brat doesn't mean that she's a bratty submissive. She might not be a submissive at all. She might be a bratty human. So that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. If I could separate myself from that or if I could just imagine they talked about it and they were both on the same page, it was fine. I really did love this book. I think that Nisha Sharma is an incredible writer. She makes great characters, great stories. I know she also writes YA. I don't know if I could go to YA after reading some of the stuff in this trilogy, but I want to see what she's coming up with next because I know she's got quite a few things in the pipeline. She She's a busy, busy woman. You can't really read these out of order. They're a little too interconnected for me to be read out of order, but Dating Dr. Deal is great. Go back, read that if you haven't gotten here because all three books are out and you don't have to wait any longer. Lucy, I'm afraid you're going to watch this. I know you read all the reviews, but I'm afraid you're also going to watch this. Oh my goodness. I read Blind Date with a Book Boyfriend by Lucy Eden and this book is just, imagine if you as a romance reader could envision your perfect book boyfriend meet cute that is exactly what this story is like. It was like all of my dreams as a romance reader playing out on the page. Jordan is in California for her dream interview to escape her kind of overbearing parents and live her life. And she's literally in a romance bookstore looking at the blind date with a book table. And this man comes up and reveals what each book 
is under the packaging based on the description. Because he reads romance novels, they make a faux bet of, oh, if you get the next one, then I will go on a date with you. And so they do. She buys a bunch of books. He buys them for her gentlemen and they go on a date here in culver city he is from the area he lives there and he takes her to his favorite restaurant and around to see the sights they go to a weird museum they talk he runs through a fountain they have a first kiss they lie about how long they've been together they share an evening and it's just adorable it's all the cinnamon roll adorable book boyfriend trope things that i want in a human whose name is Mike. Mike is revealed to be the owner of the company that Jordan is having an interview with and drama because he realized it and then didn't immediately tell her because he didn't want the day to end. This is a novella. I'm, I'm in my novella era, y'all. I, I can't stop it. Don't stop me. I'm enjoying the almost instant gratification of plowing through a novella and I'm, if I get to read ones like this, I'm not going to be mad about it. <laughs> because of its novella length, this resolves very quickly. It also resolves in a way that I appreciated. There are some boundaries that Mike pushes in, in the way that book boyfriends do. But in terms of egregious overstepping, it isn't, it isn't that at all. And I, I want my book boyfriend to be just like him. It is pretty lightly spiced, which is fine for a novella. They have a lovely bit of intimacy that night. Uh, if you want to see the quote that I love, you can go to my Instagram. That's where I post quotes from books. A detail I noticed was when they were back at Jordan's Airbnb, she wants to go to bed, sleep with him. And she says, hey, I gotta, I gotta wash my face. I gotta put on my cold cream and I have to wrap my hair. She goes, it's not cute, but it's what I need to do. And Mike does not bad an eye. If you've never been with someone who has to wrap their hair, who has to take care of their body in a different way than you do, it might seem really strange. And gentleman that he is, he doesn't care. He doesn't say anything and it doesn't stop him from getting frisky with her later either. This was so adorable. I have a few other Lucy Eden books on my bookshelf. I own the ebook of this. I'm really looking forward to getting to know her through her writing now. Imagine my surprise when I got The Omnibus for the Dark Kings by Nikki Rome and I saw a whole other story in there that I hadn't read. This is Greed. It is 0.5 in the series. And I don't know if you have to read this before the others. Honestly, it's been so long since I've read the trilogy that I don't even remember if Maya and Anton show up. I'm sure they do. Nikki is good like that. But I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything not knowing who they were. So feel free to read it beforehand. Feel free to read it after. It does come before the rest of the trilogy. I'm going to call it a trilogy because that's how I read them. It is about Maya and Anton and they're kind of on the fringes of the organized crime world that we really delve into in the Dark King series. Anton's parents were two different factions. I know, big deal. He lives on the outskirts of this world. He doesn't officially work for any family. He does mostly counterfeiting for kind of everyone, even though he's been invited to be part of various organized crime families throughout his life, and especially as, as an adult. Maya and Anton met when they were children and became incredibly close. Maya's home life was not great, and she very quickly after meeting Anton moved in with his family. They became friends friends and became lovers and they were together. Due to a event that happens before the start of this story are no longer together. It's been three years. Maya ran away and she shows up on Anton's doorstep beaten bloody. So you get a who did this to you almost immediately if that's a thing that you like. It's on page maybe five. Turns out that Maya has been turning tricks for a different person in this organized crime world for the past three years and no one told Anton. Anton's feelings are she's back, she's mine, I'm not letting her go ever again and I need to get my revenge on the person who was had control over her and is currently looking to kill her. Yeah, it's a killing thing. The mafia stuff links him to the Dark Kings, Dante, Nico, and Ares. Anton and Maya 
in their relationship before everything went down had an established kink dynamic. That was what they engaged in. That's how they connected with each other. And it's very interesting watching them fall back into the habits, but also try to resist it. There are things that they know about each other, but they, they know about each other's bodies, each other's personalities. They know how to push each other's buttons. They fight like the couple in my cousin Vinny fight. And honestly, I rooted for them the whole time. It's odd for me to say I don't often root for mafia. I don't often love mafia dynamics. I think that they can be incredibly unhealthy. However, Anton and Maya just makes sense to me. I totally see them together. I see them overcoming what happened to them in the past and moving forward into the future. And I am a little disappointed now that I'm real rehashing this that I don't remember when they came to play in <laughs> the rest of this story. But that's on me that I apparently just did not do my due diligence on this series. And I can I can live with myself because I have the omnibus. If I want to, I can go back and read it anytime I want. This book had one of the longest waits at my library for an e-copy, and it was worth it. The Emperor and the Endless Palace by Justinian Huang. Honestly, I went into this blind. I saw him at Stimulate. He was on a panel about romanticy and I adored it. I also got to chatting with him and I got a little peach signed by him, which makes no sense until you read this book. And it made no sense to me. I just kind of went, I'm going to go with it, but I love it. It usually lives on my shelf. So if you see it in the background, now you know who this is and what it's from. This is a story told in three timelines. The same couple is going through multiple lifetimes together as they find each other again and as they try to undo this wrong of their first timeline. And these are based on historical figures and stories in Chinese lore. Justinian in his author's note at the end talks about what inspired him and who he's honoring with this story. And I love the research and the kindness he shows to this history, especially gay Asian men. That is who he is and that is who this story centers around. I'm trying to think if there are any white people in this story? And the answer might be no. I'm all here for it. You've got one timeline at about 3 or 4 BCE, one in the 1740s, and then one in present day. I had to take a lot of notes. I'm not great with fantastical elements anyway, but following so many different couples or different histories, I found at first a little challenging. And then when I realized what I was reading, I enjoyed it so much. So it took me a little bit of time because I had to get used to it. It felt almost like that story. What is the Kurosawa film, Ron? Where you get the same story, multiple perspectives. That's what it felt like. It's these characters, these relationships playing out over three different timelines. I don't even know how to explain who our main characters are. So I'm going to talk about the earliest storyline, the, the one in 3 or 4 BCE. You've got the emperor, you've got a clerk, and you have a soldier. Love that forms between them. There's a grandmother that's involved. She does some shady stuff. There are teachers that are involved. And as much as we watch these humans circle each other and fall in love, we also were watching the machinations of a dynasty and history playing out in real time. There is love and betrayal and kindness and joy and sadness. And that is the original story. I don't know if this is how it actually happened, but I do love that the first time the emperor and the clerk, I'm going to say that's so wrong, but the emperor and the clerk, Dong Zhang, are together Dong Zhang falls asleep on the emperor's heirloom robe. And when he wakes, he discovers the emperor didn't want to let him go. And so he cut off his sleeve so he wouldn't disturb Dong Zhang in sleep. Oh my gosh, it's so fucking romantic. So romantic. And I loved it. There's betrayal and there's sadness at the end of that story. In the second one, we see magic and mystery and some of the the baggage from that first go around play out and be shed where I, I like don't even want to give away these endings like I loved the mystery of it so much that I don't want to give it away then in the present time we see River meeting Joey 
and Winston and trying to figure out what their relationships are and who's remembering what and who's attracted to who it it was so luscious the story itself is beautiful it is so lightly spiced the reason it felt lightly spiced to me is because it wasn't explicit language it was things like his influence there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with light spice there's nothing wrong with kind of poetic language but it definitely felt less like intimacy and more like watching a ballet about intimacy if that makes sense this book had me hooked once i figured out who everyone was i was hooked and i needed to figure out how we got from the original story with dong zhang all the way to the present day there are some plot twists there are some things that shake your understanding of what you're viewing i was all here for it i thought this was an incredible debut novel i'm sad it took me so long to get it from my library happy that so many other people are reading it i'm gonna treasure this peach even more now having read the story and i hope that y'all go and read it because oh my gosh i want someone else to understand this too Therese, i just wasn't ready for you to break my heart or have me send you two ham dms so i read the christmas war pause Sorry, not sorry. I will. I will read your other books. I will let you send me into heart palpitations, but that day is not today, my friend. This is a Christmas novella by Therese M. Clark. I'm going to put it down. It is very short and sweet. I got to know Therese at Smut Lovers, and even though she writes kind of suspenseful real novels, one's up there, I wanted to read something of hers first. I'm not ready for my heart to be broken yet. I'm just not in the mood for it. It is short, sweet. It is real enemies to lovers. This is not going to make you sweat. Francesca and Sebastian knew each other in vet school. They dated. There were some misunderstandings. They had a huge falling out. Sebastian also lives in the town that Francesca's grandmother was in. Francesca has a very complicated relationship with her father, who's an ass, and her grandmother, who he estranged her from. Her grandmother has just passed. She is back in the small town of Ohio Falls to settle the estate of her grandmother's. There is a meet cute involving an adorable injured dog, and Francesca finds herself at the local vet who is now Sebastian and his sister. There is so much bad blood between the two of them. This misunderstanding was a huge, huge thing. And so they are straight up enemies to lovers at this point. It is also second chance because they were together back in veterinary school. Their rivalry, their pranks get the attention of the entire town. So much so that the mayor, instead of arresting them or finding them for the illegal snowball fight that disrupted the entire town square, he says they have to participate in the town's Christmas pageant contest situation. There are more pranks, there are more shenanigans, and very quickly, because it's a novella, it's, it's thin. It's a hundred pages. Because of the forced proximity, there is even a, we're stuck, snowed in, in a truck overnight. So we decide to hate fuck each other. Should I bleep that out? Oh, well. I'm going to suspend my disbelief and say that one of the things that usually annoys me is when all of this could be fixed with a conversation. And the conversation, when it happens, everything is understood very quickly. Oh no, you didn't mean to. I didn't do this. You didn't do that. Wow. Maybe we shouldn't have been so mad at each other way back in the day. And the thing that saved it for me from being incredibly annoying is that we didn't witness the miscommunication in the first place and we only saw the resolution. Thank goodness for that. If I'd had to witness that miscommunication, I probably would have thrown the book across the room. It's just not for me. There is some good spice but 100 pages. It's just not terribly detailed spice. There is a car. There is a sleigh. There is some fun. There's an ex-husband that shows up for little to no reason except a plot device. And you know what? I'm here for it. I was looking for something short, sweet, and by my friend Therese, and I got that. It's everything that I wanted it to be. You're entering your holiday novella era. Put this one on your list. I read Six Scorched Roses by Carissa Broadband. This is book 1.5 in the Crowns of Nixia series. I did read Serpent in the Wings of Night. As y'all know, I love a vampire. I've gotten more into vampires in fantasy recently. I'm very well versed in PNR vampires, the ones that live in our world, but 
the world where there are vampires that aren't our world, I am really starting to enjoy those a lot. So send me your recommendations. If you have read Serpent in the Wings of Night, this is completely separate at this point. This book, according to Carissa Broadbent's website, doesn't have to be read as 1.5. It can be read after book two or even later, just not before book one. I did read it before book two. I haven't read book two yet just because technically it was there on her list. It could be read between book one and two. And so I wanted to take advantage of that before I go into the next one. The story of Lilith and Vale takes place completely separately from the story in book one. It's not even on the same continent. This is in the human realm on the other side of the sea. We meet Lilith, who is an ill human in a town full of plague. She believes her town has been cursed by their patron god and people are wasting away. She was born with chronic illness and enough is alluded to when it comes to Lilith that I also believe she has some neurodivergency. And I don't know if the reason it's not actually stated is because those words don't exist in the world that Carissa Broadbent created or if it wasn't intentional and if not, well, she seems really neurodivergent to me based on how she speaks about herself and her relationship to others. So I'm just going to put my two cents out there. Lilith is a scientist. She has studied and she's searching for a cure. Her father has already passed from this plague. Her mother had died in childbirth with her younger sister and her younger sister is now suffering at the hands of this plague. As a last resort, Lilith goes to Lord Vale. He is a vampire who lives up in the hills many hours walks away and she believes that she can distill whatever is keeping him undead in his blood and turn it into a cure for the people of her village and specifically her sister. As an offering to Lord Vale, she brings this unique rose that grows outside of her house. It is black with red on the edges of her petals. I believe they're called Scorched Roses, or that's what I'm guessing they are. That's the title of this story. And she offers him a rose for every time she comes to drain blood from him. There are some other plot things that happen. She's attacked, he saves her, they develop a rapport. She discovers that he is self-exiled from the vampire realm after the last big war, the turnover between the two factions of the vampires. If you haven't read Serpent in the Wings of Night, this will make no sense. But for those of you who have, it should make a little bit of sense. And they are faced with the challenge of what happens when you develop feelings for someone you can never be with. Lilith views herself as someone who is dying on the cusp of death, fighting for the survival of her town. Lord Vale is self-exiled. He knows what's happening across the water. He knows that there's about to be another revolution and he's been asked to be part of it and he can't bring himself to be that vulnerable. There's a moment where he says, I had one love and it was for my kingdom and I gave it my all and I lost it. And he's heartbroken. There is light intimacy in this story, same as Serpent in the Wings of Night. This is much more plot focused than spice focused. And that mm, might be exactly what you're looking for. It might be exactly what you are not looking for. But I do want you to know, this is a novella. It is a shorter story, less than 300 pages. So it's quick to get through. Also, because it's a very personal story about the two of them, there's very little outside drama until the end, and even that isn't terribly complicated. The outside story is not as dire or complex as it is in Serpent in the Wings of Night, and my guess is the other full-length novels in this series. It is a quick read. You do have to read book one to get through it. It isn't going to put too much pressure on your brain to try and follow along. I really enjoyed it. I know that these characters from her website come back to play in other books and I can't wait to see what they get up to next.